Three of the landing Three of the landing craft on right were hit in quick succession. An 88mm gun was enfilading the beach from an emplacement at that end. He watched his third tank go out and waited with an interest which was almost detached for the German gun to raise its sights to him. For the landing craft, lying still and almost broadside to the gun, was a target which it could not possibly have missed. But the last of his tanks went into the water, and the moment it was clear the ramp was raised and the engines put astern. The work of a landing craft was dangerous but short. Rockwell's own job was finished on the stroke of H hour. The tanks were ashore, and his only duty then was to get his craft away in safety if he could. Seven of the eight backed out from the beach, two burning. One was left there wrecked. But the German fire which had concentrated on them for the first few seconds seemed now to be random. Many more guns on the bluffs had begun to shoot, but they had shifted their targets. Rockwell saw the first of his tanks start to pick its way between the obstacles on the beach. Before it had gone ten yards from the water, it burst, and looking astern as his craft got underway, he saw the new targets which had drawn the German fire, the infantry landing craft, ploughing their way towards the breakers, running the gauntlet. The first of these landing craft should have been carrying infantry, with the Navy Army demolition force close behind them, but on some parts of the beach they all arrived together, and on some the demolition men were in the lead. This letter was written by a demolition man. We stood looking over the side at the beach we were to go in at soon. We were all happy and smiling, telling jokes and yelling. Six o'clock came and we went in. There hadn't been a shot fired from the enemy yet. But soon as we dropped our ramp, an 88mm came tearing in, terminating almost half our men right there, the officer being the first one. We all thought him the best officer the Navy ever had. From then on, things got hazy to me. I remember the chief starting to take over, but then another one hit, and that did it. When I woke, I seen a big hole in the bulkhead between the sergeant and me. He was dead, it must have been instant. I was injured from head to foot, but didn't know it at the time. I looked round and seen no one else alive, so I went overboard and headed for the beach. The surf was filled with soldiers trying to get ashore, but the bullets in the surf from the enemy were thick. They were getting terminated fast. I reached the obstacles and got behind one to shelter. Just then the landing craft blew up. That got me. Not caring whether I lived or not, I started to run, through the fire up the beach, which was plenty far to run. It probably seemed longer at that time. That's when I found my leg and arm stiff. After a while, the soldiers were pouring in thick. I did a little rifle firing with the... A great many of the 1,450 men of the eight companies of infantry also suffered this kind of experience. One company, landing on the western end of the beach, a little to the right of Rockwell's tanks, had one of its six craft sunk half a mile from shore. Men were seen jumping overboard and being dragged down by their equipment, which was too heavy to allow them to swim. A second craft was blown to pieces by mortar fire. The other four grounded and the men scrambled out, but the beach had deep runnels there, and some men were out of their depth. Intense machine gun and mortar fire enveloped them. Many were wounded in the water and fell down and were drowned. Those who struggled to land took refuge behind the German obstacles or went back into the sea for cover. A few formed a firing line on the water's edge, but soon all the officers of the company and most of the sergeants were terminated or wounded, and the men, without leaders, gave up any hope of advancing across the beach. Within 15 minutes, the company was out of action. Some of its survivors stayed in the water all the morning and succeeded in reaching safety in the end by crawling up the beach as the tide came in. This company had landed in the right place. The only other infantry who did so were a small company of rangers who had a special mission on the right-hand end of the beach. All the rest of the eight companies were carried eastward by the same tidal stream that had upset the landing at Utah. It had not mattered at Utah. The infantry had landed at the wrong place but in good order, and the weakness of the opposition had given them time to organise. But here at Omaha, all order was lost before the soldiers reached the shore at all. Some craft were only 200 yards to the east of the places where they should have been. Some were a mile. One company, after two of its craft were swamped, approached the shore two miles away and had to come back against the wind and tide, and landed 90 minutes late. All the others were mixed up together, 
Two stretches of the beach, both half a mile long, had no infantry at all. Other parts had too many. Men found themselves pitched onto the shore in single boatloads, cut off from their officers, faced with defences which were not the ones they had studied in their briefing, under a terrible gunfire which they had never been warned to expect, and with nobody to tell them where they were or what they ought to do. Almost all the heavier weapons were lost in the struggle through the surf, and most of the men who succeeded in crossing the beach and reaching the temporary safety of the shingle were so shaken by the ordeal that for the time being no organised action was possible. Not even the heaviest gunfire put such a strain on a soldier's morale as not being told what to do. In this respect, the demolition men were better off than the infantry. They had a specific job to do, and they could do it, or try to do it, wherever they landed. There were the obstacles in front of them, and each team of them, one officer and a dozen men, had to clear a fifty-yard gap right through to high water mark, and they had to do it quickly because the tide was rising. To move and work on that beach would have seemed impossible if they had stopped to think, but none of them had time to stop or think. The training of the demolition force on the sandy shores near Barnstaple in Devon had been hurried and incomplete. It was hurried because obstacles on Omaha Beach had only been seen in reconnaissance photographs for the first time in April, and then, under Rommel's pressure, had multiplied very quickly. It was incomplete because nobody knew exactly what the obstacles were like. They could not tell from the photographs what the things were made of, or how they were put together, or whether they were mined. Perhaps the American demolition men were not well served by their liaison with the British, for British commandos had landed on different parts of the coast of France and inspected at least three kinds of obstacles, steel hedgehogs, and wooden ramps and stakes, and had taken measurements of them at their leisure. But only part of this information filtered through to the Americans, and their plans for getting rid of the obstacles had to include an element of guesswork. Even the organisation of their teams was rather an improvisation. They had started as a naval force, divided into teams of one officer and seven enlisted men, sixteen teams, to blow sixteen gaps in the defences. But whenever new photographs were taken of Omaha Beach, the belt of obstacles was seen to have grown more complex, and not long before D-Day, the naval command concluded that a team of eight men was too small to blow a gap during the half hour which the plan allowed them. The navy had no more men to spare, so the army lent them some. Five army men were added to each of the naval teams. The commander of this peculiar composite force was a naval reserve officer called Joseph H. Gibbons, and in their six weeks of training, Gibbons had managed to make his men sure that nothing could stop them doing the job they had been assigned to do. He himself was prepared for the job to be tough, but a tough job suited him well. And indeed, he had probably been chosen more for his character than for his knowledge of demolition, which was small. He was a powerfully built man of moderate height, with a bulldog's tenacity, and a habit of saying exactly what he thought no matter who was listening. Strict, outspoken, fair, a man to whom right was right and wrong was wrong, and no shades of rightness existed in between. He was very much aware of his responsibility to the Navy, and especially to his men, whom he treated like a very stern, old-fashioned and yet affectionate father. These qualities probably dated back to his upbringing in the woods and the blue-grass country of Kentucky, and perhaps they owed something to his training at the Naval Academy at Annapolis, for he had graduated there in the twenties, but then had left the service, which seemed a dead end to him, and taken a job in a telephone company. Whoever discovered Gibbons and appointed him to his command had made a clever choice. He was exactly the man to give his forces the moral impetus they needed to carry them through the ordeal on the beach. Gibbons himself landed exactly in the middle of the beach. As he was in charge of all sixteen teams, the job he had planned for himself was simply to walk along the beach and see how they got on and help them when help was needed. And that is what he did. He was absorbed by his technical problems. The thought was certainly there in the back of his mind that something must have gone wrong, and that conditions were very much worse than anyone had expected, but the gunfire tearing down the beach worried him first and foremost for the effect it might have on the job. The first two of his men he met told him the whole of the test of their team had been terminated while they were landing. He told them to take cover behind the shingle bank till he found a job for them. Next, he found a team which had landed intact and started already to fasten its charges to the obstacles. Each man had landed with a string of two-pound blocks of explosive round his waist 
and each team had an extra supply in a rubber boat which it was supposed to haul ashore from its landing craft. Gibbons had always expected the best of his men. Watching this team, he was very proud to see how well they justified his confidence. He saw them moving methodically from one obstacle to another, taping the charges onto the stakes and angle irons quickly but not hastily. One of them was running out the instantaneous fuse which was to connect all the charges together. One had laid out the two buoys which were to mark the gap, and was going up the beach carrying posts with triangles on them, which he had to set up as additional markers in line at the top of the beach. None of them was showing any visible sign of eat. Gibbons moved on. Absorbed as he was, his walk had some incidents. Once, suddenly aware of shells bursting all round him, he dived into a hole in the sand. Another man, a moment later, dived in on top of him, shouting furiously, Get out of my foxhole! Gibbons got out, ashamed of himself, and did not go to ground again. Somewhere along the beach, another thing penetrated his consciousness. A scream, a long, agonising scream, which seemed to express not only fear and pain, but amazement, consternation and disbelief. He found other teams at work, and other teams decimated on the water's edge and he found a gap blown and the wreckage of the obstacles. He watched the tide rising. At half-tide it rose a foot in eight minutes, and within the first few minutes of the landing it was among the outer obstacles, swirling into the runnels and advancing at an average of a yard a minute up the gentle slope of yellow sand. On the beach he only gained a rough impression of his men working against time under conditions which he vaguely knew were terrible. It was not till later in the day when the tide put an end to their efforts, and their survivors took refuge at last behind the shingle, that he began to learn the extent of their successes, and heard of the accidents which had overwhelmed the teams which had failed. Five gaps had been blown, and two partially blown, out of the sixteen which had been planned. Two or three teams had been lost before they landed, or been landed so late that the tide was up before they got to work. At least two had been lost in landing. One had had its rubber boat hit by a shell while the whole team was gathered round it, dragging it ashore. It blew most of them to pieces. One team had laid all its charges and connected them, and the men were still standing by them preparing to fire them when a shell hit the fuse and ignited it and set off all the charges prematurely and wounded or terminated them all except the man with the markers. One team had everything ready when some tanks arriving late drove over the fuses and cut them to pieces so that the charges could not be fired at all. The remaining teams were all delayed by a humanitarian consideration which nobody could possibly have thought of. The infantry, desperate for cover, who huddled in groups behind the slenderest obstacles. One of the warrant officers, his charges laid and ready at the cost of the lives of two of his own twelve men, ran round frenziedly kicking the soldiers to try to make them move so that he could fire the charges. Another team leader, when every persuasion had failed, lit his fuse and then ran round from one obstacle to another, shouting to the men that it was burning and they had half a minute to get out. For some teams, the difficulty was worse, because wounded men had been dragged into the imaginary shelter of the obstacles, and they could not move. Some teams wasted so much time in trying to clear men off the beach that the tide rose and drowned their charges and their gaps were never blown. None of them could bring themselves to do what the logic of war demanded, blow the gap and terminate their own countrymen. In the face of all these difficulties, the blowing of five gaps was a wonderful achievement, although it was only a third of the number planned. Gibbons might say he had never been brave himself, but his unit action might well be judged the most gallant of all on D-Day. Of his 272 engineers, 111 were terminated or wounded, almost all in the first half hour. Yet their gallantry was largely wasted by hastiness in planning. The fault lay with the markers they had been given. Some of the buoys and posts they had brought to mark the gaps were lost or broken in the landing. The posts which they set up at the top of the beach were easily knocked down and were not conspicuous enough to be seen through the smoke from seaward. The buoys, which they laid on each side of each gap, were ordinary metal dan buoys with a spar and a flag on top, but they could be punctured and sunk by a single rifle bullet, and instead of being port and starboard buoys, they were all the same colour, so that when one was sunk, nobody could tell which side of the gap was marked by the one which remained. So when the tide had risen and covered the obstacles, 
The gaps which had been made by such sacrifice were practically impossible to find. All the morning, landing craft skippers milled around offshore looking for buoys and posts, and most of them, knowing that gaps had been planned, hesitated to trust to luck and charge the obstacles. Two other cumulative disasters helped to deprive the stricken infantry of the support which they had the right to expect. A large proportion of the artillery intended to land in the first few hours had been loaded in the amphibious trucks called dukus. This plan had simply not made enough allowance for the rough sea which can be found in the English Channel even in June. With guns, ammunition, sandbags and men on board, the dukus were top-heavy and the great majority were swamped or rolled over in the sea. Secondly, it was a long time before army engineers succeeded in making any gaps in the bank of shingle, which was too steep for vehicles or even tanks to cross, and so the tanks were not able to lead the infantry in any advance beyond the beach itself. The reasons for this delay again were losses of equipment. Explosives had been lost in the surf. Sixteen bulldozers had been provided, but only three survived, and one of those was unable to manoeuvre because of the infantrymen who clung to its shelter. No gaps were made in the bank until ten o'clock. By then, high tide was approaching. The tanks, which were still in action, had been penned into a strip of beach which was only a few yards wide. Other kinds of vehicles, jeeps, trucks and half-tracks had started to land, and as the tide rolled up to the shingle, all of them were caught in a dense jam of vehicles, men and wreckage, from which nothing could escape towards the gaps. This concentration of material was still under fire from German guns at close range, and an order had to be sent by a naval radio which had been landed in working order to suspend all landings of vehicles till something could be done to clear the beach. Into this scene of confusion and death, just before the landings were halted, a landing craft disgorged a unit of anti-aircraft guns mounted on half-tracks, of which one section was commanded by a sergeant called Hyman Haas, and Haas's experience was typical of that stage of the battle, except for the very unusual fact that he brought his whole section and his guns and vehicles through it with hardly a scratch on the paint. Hyman Haas's job was making frames for ladies' handbags. He came from the Bronx and was cheerful, friendly and efficient. This was his first combat. Haas's unit were principally trained as anti-aircraft, but they had also practiced on surface targets, and that was just as well. Even while they were still out at sea, he knew they were out of a job as anti-aircraft gunners, because the sky was full of planes with black and white stripes of distemper, and there was never a single German to be seen. But the moment they hit the beach, they found a job which was very much more important, to help to take the place of the artillery which had founded in the Dukus. Like everybody else, Haas was shocked and amazed at his first close sight of the beach, and like everybody else, he found that his orders were impossible to fulfil as they had been planned. He was supposed to drive his half-tracks straight across the beach and up one of the valleys to the village of Saint Laurent at its head, and then set up his guns on the top of the bluffs. He was landed in the right place. The water was deep. It came up to his waist in the cab where he was sitting with his driver, but his waterproofing held, and the half-track wallowed through the water to the sand. There was the valley, just where he had expected it to be, but there also, only a few yards ahead of him, was the shingle bank, still intact and impassable, and between him and it were the debris, the wrecks of tanks, the corpses and the hundreds of crouching men. There was no room to go forward at all. To let the rest of his unit squeeze onto the beach behind him, he had to tell his driver to turn to the right and try to move out of the way between the wreckage and the water. The sight of a 37mm gun coming ashore just behind them must have appeared as a godsend to the infantry, some of whom had been there for two hours without any artillery at all. An officer ran towards Haas before he had even stopped, shouting and pointing out a pillbox on the side of the bluff about 300 yards away. Haas looked at it and saw it fire. His own gun was mounted so that it could not fire forward on low elevation. There was no room to turn round on the beach. He told his driver to turn to the right again and drive back into the sea. That brought the half-track stern onto the bluffs, and there, half-submerged in the surf again, Haas trained his gun and laid it on the pillbox. He fired ten rounds. So far as he could see, they all went through the aperture and exploded inside. Anyhow, the German gun was silent after that. By then, the whole of the unit was ashore, 
and for a long time nobody showed Haas another target. There was nothing for him to do but to sit and wait, and hope that somebody somewhere would punch a hole in the shingle bank and let him move before his gun was destroyed. Few people had the opportunity that morning to see the landing at Omaha as a whole, but to all who did, it seemed for several hours that the attack was going to fail. A German officer in the fortifications on the cliffs at the west end of the beach counted ten tanks and a great many other vehicles burning, and saw the American troops taking cover behind the shingle and the dead and wounded lying on the sand, and he reported that he believed the invasion had been halted on the shore. The German divisional commander, receiving this and similar reports, was so confident of the outcome that he sent a part of his reserves to counterattack the British farther east. General Bradley, out on the cruiser Augusta, could do nothing at that stage to influence events. The battle, he wrote later, had run beyond the reach of its admirals and generals. All the morning he was extremely anxious at the alarming and confused reports which came in by radio. About nine o'clock he sent an observer close in shore in a fast patrol boat, but his first-hand report was no more reassuring. He had been able to see the shambles on the beach, and another staff officer who was very close in at the same time reported landing craft milling around like a stampeded herd of cattle. At noon, a further radio report told Bradley that the situation was still critical, and he began then to contemplate diverting his follow-up forces from Omaha to Utah and to the British beaches, a decision which would presumably have meant writing off the landing at Omaha as a failure, and abandoning most of the forces already ashore to be terminated or captured. For the next hour and a half, this alarming prospect remained in the general's mind. So near did Omaha come to defeat, and then, at 1.30, seven hours after the landing, he received the message. Troops formally pinned down advancing up heights behind beaches. Something had tipped the balance which had been swinging towards defeat, and inclined it slightly at last towards victory. It was partly the slow effect of the almost irresistible weight of American arms. The American forces could lose all the tanks and all the artillery in the first waves of their attack. There were still enormous quantities of tanks and artillery to follow in later waves. They could even lose their infantry. Manpower was no problem, for tens of thousands more men were waiting and ready to go in. But the German defences, strong though they were, were limited and immobile. From time to time, a lucky shot like Haas's wrote off a pillbox, and nothing could replace it. Time was bound to wear the static defences down. This process was certainly quickened by the Navy's intervention. The naval bombardment had been scheduled to stop three minutes before the troops landed, for fear, of course, of hitting them while they advanced. But when it became obvious that the soldiers were not advancing at all, but were penned on the beach, and that the situation was desperate, destroyers were ordered in as close as they could go to shell whatever targets they could see. Some of them went in till they scraped their keels on the sandy bottom. So, by naval fire aided by the remnants of artillery on the beach, German guns were silenced one by one, and German fire against the beach must slowly have been slackening. But none of the men on the beach were aware of any slackening. It is nearly as bad to be shot at by ten guns as by twenty. What really turned the balance was a final stubborn reserve of human courage. It came to the surface quite independently, at several different places on the beach. The shock of the landing had numbed the willpower of a great many men, not because their morale or their courage was particularly weak, but simply because the shock was too great for any ordinary man. The loss of leaders and lack of orders had created a feeling of hopelessness and lethargy, but here and there during the morning, officers and NCOs of more than ordinary moral strength, recovering more quickly than others from the shock, began to take stock of the situation and to rally whatever men they happened to find around them. It is impossible to say how many of these natural leaders were discovered by the very severity of the position on the beach. Perhaps there were a score, perhaps a hundred. None of them had any example to follow, or knew that anyone else was even trying to break the deadlock, because in general nobody knew what was happening beyond the very limited distance he could see. Sometimes a single man's action inspired others. Sometimes men had to be bullied or persuaded. Sometimes a single concise remark stuck in men's minds long afterwards as the turning point, and was repeated in recollection after the battle was over, and so found its way into official records. On one bit of the beach, 
A lieutenant and a wounded sergeant quite suddenly stood up among the men who were lurking behind the shingle and walked over the top of it, the very thing which nobody had dared to do. They looked at the wire entanglement just beyond the bank, and then the lieutenant came back and stood on top and looked down at the cowering men and said to nobody in particular, Are you going to lay there and get terminated, or get up and do something about it? Nobody moved, so he and the sergeant found explosives and blew a hole in the wire, and then men began to stir. An infantry colonel on another part of the beach in the same situation expressed the same thought. Two kinds of people are staying on this beach, fallen, and those who are critically injured. Now let's get out of here. In the largest and most effective advance which was made from the beach that morning, it was actually a private soldier who was the first to go over the bank and set a Bangalore torpedo in the wire. Before he could fire it, he was terminated. A lieutenant went over next and fired it and blew a gap. The first man to try the gap was shot, but others made it, in twos and threes, and found shelter in some empty German trenches, and little by little the numbers increased till the remnants of a whole company were following. In this way, several small groups of men, mostly ill-armed and mostly unsupported, began to creep inland behind a leader. The groups varied in size, from half a dozen men to a company, and each of them, so far as its members knew, was alone in trying to penetrate inland. Nobody will ever know how many groups started and failed. Roughly a dozen succeeded. None of those which succeeded were opposite the strongly defended valleys. They were all in between them. There they began to find that there was really more cover beyond the beach than on it. There were ruins and bushes and small folds and hollows in the face of the bluffs. Once they were clear of the beach, they found the German fire less dangerous than the minefields. None of them had time to clear the mines, and few of them had the knowledge or apparatus. One engineer lieutenant, who was trained in mines but had no mine detector, led men through a minefield in the marsh below the bluffs by crawling on his stomach and probing with a hunting knife. Most of these tentative advances were made in single file, each man treading in the footsteps of the man in front, stepping over the men whom the mines had terminated. In some minefields, wounded men were left lying where they fell while a column walked over them, because the column could not be stopped and there was no room, on the narrow track which was proved to be safe, to carry them back to the beach. It was through these hesitant columns of shocked and weary men that the advance from Omaha began. The landing there, one-fourth of the whole invasion, had stood on the verge of failure, but a few brave men, mostly of junior rank, had refused to believe it had failed, and had begun to lead their companions to success. But for the whole of the day, success remained uncertain. By noon, a few of the infantry were up the bluffs, and began to attack the defences from behind. But no tanks or artillery could follow them, because the valleys were still being strongly held. Sergeant Haas saw soldiers on the skyline of the bluffs above him, but he still had to wait for a gap in the shingle through which he could drive his half-track, and until he could move he could not find any targets for his guns. Almost all the beach obstacles were still intact, and were still a menace to the landing of reinforcements. Gibbons was still waiting impatiently for the tide to go down again, so that he could renew his attack on them. Communications hardly existed at all. Most of the radios which had been landed were full of salt water, and it was long after nightfall before anyone had any use for the telephone wire which Henry Myers, the mathematician from Brooklyn, had carried ashore and was waiting to lay inland. Through all these hours, a strong counter-attack could have pushed the whole of the American forces off Omaha Beach and back into the sea again, but no counter-attack was made, and for this reprieve, as for so much else, the thanks of the troops on the ground were due to the air forces which had won complete supremacy in Western Europe. Allied aircraft that day were delaying the movement of German reserves far and wide over France, and before that day they had already played their part in disrupting communications and in sowing confusion in the minds of the German commanders. From the first moment when parachute landings had been reported, the German command had been reluctant to believe a real invasion was beginning, because of the weather. The Germans were far less well equipped than the British and Americans with weather stations in the North Atlantic area. This was partly, of course, a matter of geography, but partly also because their air force had been worn down to a point at which it could hardly risk long-range aircraft on weather reconnaissance. As a result, 
their meteorologists failed to forecast the temporary break in the weather which had been spotted by Heisenhower's advisers. They predicted nothing but bad weather, and on the strength of a forecast which seemed to offer safety from invasion for several days, Field Marshal Rommel had gone to Germany to spend a day at home and then to report to Hitler, and in the invasion area itself all the divisional commanders had been summoned to a meeting in Brittany, which was to take place on the morning of the 6th. Even when the landings had started, it seemed unlikely to the German High Command that the Allies would have launched a full-scale attack with such a forecast. To this unwillingness to believe the truth, the Allied air forces had added uncertainty by keeping German reconnaissance aircraft away and by successfully attacking German radar stations. German reconnaissance flights in the previous week had reached the Dover area and reported the dummy fleet which was lying there, but had not been able to penetrate to the English harbours farther west, where the real fleet was waiting. The early warning radar stations along the coast of France were sufficient, in theory, to detect ships or aircraft over most of the English Channel, but in that same week the stations had been bombed, and on the night of the landing those which remained were jammed. However, enough of them were deliberately left in working order in the eastern part of the Channel to ensure that the dummy fleets approaching the Calais area were detected. To the High Command, a full-scale landing anywhere that morning therefore seemed unlikely. The information which reached von Rundstedt's and Rommel's headquarters was meagre, and what there was of it seemed on the whole to confirm von Rundstedt's belief that the main attack would come in Calais, and to suggest that the action in Normandy was a mere diversion. At the crucial moment, they hesitated to throw in the whole weight of their reserves. Their reaction was also delayed by the fact that their command was divided between the army and the Nazi party. The army had one armoured division close to the invasion shore. It was stationed near Caen and was in action against the British early in the day. There were two more first-class armoured divisions between Normandy and Paris, but they were SS divisions, Nazi party units which were not under the army's direct command, and von Rundstedt had been forbidden by Hitler to commit them to battle without consulting him. Before dawn, von Rundstedt's chief of staff asked for Hitler's permission to move them up, but Hitler at home in Berchtesgaden refused to let them move to the west, in case it should be true that the main attack was still to come in the east. Having made this decision, Hitler took a sleeping draught and went to bed, and his decision was not reversed till the afternoon. By then, it was much too late for the two divisions to play any part in opposing the first assault, and when they did begin to move, they found movement by daylight made almost impossible by Allied fighter bombers which patrolled the roads and even hunted out tanks which tried to advance across country. These armoured divisions were the nearest strategic reserves. The tactical reserves close to Omaha Beach had already been dissipated. There were two infantry brigades, but before the landing at Omaha had been reported, part of this force had been dispatched to the west to tackle the American airborne landing, and during the morning most of the rest of it was moved east, to a point where the British were quickly advancing inland. The Atlantic Wall at Omaha